As a nation, we're about to celebrate one of my favorite holidays, Memorial Day. And this Memorial Day promises, it guarantees to be better than last year. How could it not be? Yes, this year will be better because we have the freedom to do what we normally do. This year we'll again assemble with family, with friends, and with neighbors. We may see family and friends that we haven't seen in a while. We'll no doubt cook out and enjoy the last bit of the beautiful spring weather season. We'll eat and drink and enjoy our freedom, a gift that we as Americans, most Americans, take for granted. The last year served as a reminder of how amazing the blessing of freedom really is and how painful life is when we're without it. Many throughout history and throughout our history in the United States have never tasted freedom. Some in our own nation, they still feel that way today. Freedom's the reason we celebrate Memorial Day. Actually, we celebrate the freedom fighters, the men and the women who have fought and died to bless us with that gift. It's indeed appropriate that we celebrate those who have served and continue to serve our nation. And from the bottom of our hearts, we say thank you. In the spirit of celebrating our freedom fighters, we decided today to also celebrate a different kind of freedom fighter, the peaceful warrior who has fought and continue to fight without picking up a weapon. Dr. Martin Luther King, he was one of those warriors. He was a courageous leader who died fighting for our brothers and our sisters for their freedom. That battle, his battle, our nation's battle, it continues today. As we celebrate this year, our nation is like every one of us, inspired to be our best, sure, but just like us, our nation has work to do to become its best, and every one of us needs to do his or her part to help us get to best. We can never repay the debt we owe to those who have fought and died for our freedom, including Dr. King, but we can try. Dr. King wasn't just a warrior, he was also a dreamer. He had a dream that his four little children would one day live in a nation where they wouldn't be judged by the color of their skin, but they'd be judged by the content of their character. He dreamt of a nation where everybody could be great because everybody could serve. No matter what we do and where we do it, we can help make that dream become a reality. Best, it calls us to serve our family, our friends, serve our coworkers, serve our customers, you, serve our neighbors, and serve our nation. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Martin Luther King's daughter, Dr. Bernice King. She's picked up the mantle of leadership and service worn by her father, and we're gonna learn how each of us can do our part to truly be free, to truly serve, to truly be great, to truly be one nation, under God. I'm Bob Kalinske. I'm Kay Evans. We're co-owners of the Southeast Region. We got together 22 years ago as a partnership and we had one thing we totally agreed on. And that's service, giving back to our community. It's very important to us through our offices and through ourselves personally. Our market centers, our agents, our staff, our leadership are all committed to service in their community. One of the things we do is we embrace Red Day. Red Day means renew, energize, and donate. And that's what our market centers do on that red day. They renew, energize, and donate something important back to their communities to say thank you. This is our national day uh, all across the world with Keller Williams where we shut down and give back. That is so cool because in, in the um, Matthews 25, verse 34 through 40, God said, you have to give back your riches. You have to give back um, from the kingdom to help. One of my personal things is auto gift. I love to give to auto gift because they give cars, free cars, 
to women who cannot afford transportation, have kids, and are on their own. I work with Every Woman Works, and I have been working with them a number of years, and it is a program that prepares women who've been in a hard place in their lives to get out, get a job. It teaches them life skills, but it also teaches them work skills. I love Every Woman Works. We're a service-based company. Let's take a look at some of the things that some of our companies do to serve their communities. Good day, this is Gene Whitten. We own and operate Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate for South Florida. And the way we give back is through Rebuilding America. Hi, I'm Dory Hicks with Keller Williams Peachtree Road. I serve my community through the many charities our agents help. The Solidary Food Pantry in Sandy Springs, the Fuji Academy in Clarkston, Georgia, and anything relating to pups. Hi, I'm Greg Sanders with Sanders team of Realty One Group Edge. One of the ways that I serve my community is through a partnership with 104.7 The Fish to support families in need during the holiday season. Hi, I'm Brett Caldwell with Keller Williams Heart of Atlanta Group here in Atlanta, Georgia. I serve my community through the Solidarity Sandy Springs organization, which is a food pantry and a meal service organization. Hi, I'm Inga Lashinsky with Keller Williams Buckhead. We serve our community through our annual Red Day. Hey guys, I'm Jason from Keller Williams Atlanta Midtown and I serve my community through Wholesome Wave Georgia. Hi, I'm Jean Rawls with Keller Williams Realty. I serve my community in various ways, one being the Humble Hustle Organization. Well, this is Jim Alexander at Keller Williams Atlanta North and I was so proud of our office last week. We were able to raise enough money to buy 21 kids beds and their organization is Children Without Beds. Hello, my name is John Castelli, and I'm with Castelli Real Estate Services in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we serve our community here by our check requests, have a place where the agents can donate from their commission to the Broward Partnership for the Homeless. I'm Marcy Fair. Through Cares for Kids and Keller Williams Realty Atlanta Partners, I work with amazing people who volunteer their time, their energy, and their hearts to help children in need in their local communities. Hi, I'm Matt Pitts with Keller Williams. I serve my community through Rescuing Hope here in Marietta, Georgia. Hey, this is Ryan Graham of Community and Council Realty Group of Keller Williams in town Atlanta. We serve our communities by each focusing in on something that's important to us and something it's a way that we can improve our communities. For me, that's the Olmstead Linear Park Alliance. Everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Hello. Hello. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Oh my goodness. Being in this place. <laughs> Amazing. That's my first time here. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit in awe of the whole scene. Let's get started. First of all, welcome uh, Dr. Bernice King to Personal and Professional Best. We're glad to have you today. Thank you. Glad to be here. So our program this month is specifically to invest in folks uh, the idea of faith and or community service, because if someone is traveling without faith, they can still serve in the community. But since we're here at Ebenezer, it feels to me like it's about faith and community service today, a little bit for us. Who specifically do you believe um, inspired your pops? And maybe what specifically did um, to, to go on the mission that he did, uh, which was really a mission about community service, and it was a mission about changing our nation and getting our nation on the road to best, to mm -hmm. the best place. And it really changed the world in many ways, and it continues to, but who, who was the person? I, I, I would say two things. One, obviously his family, because of the service uh, that both my great-grandfather and my grandfather uh, provided um, in terms of, you know, integration, um, but a, a story, an experience that happened to my father uh, when he was six years old. At that time, um, he had a couple of friends, white boys who uh, lived, they didn't live across, their parents had a store across the street from the home. 
and he used to play with them every day. Mm. Um, and suddenly there were all these excuses that were being presented and he was told he could no longer play with them. Mm. Well, what was happening is the reality of segregation in the South was about to separate those friends because my father was getting ready to enter school. Oh my goodness. Uh, and it really pierced him. Mm. And he went home and crying and my grandmother at that time had to sit her sit him on her knee and just explain the, the, the history of slavery and segregation um, and say to him, you're, you're just as good as anybody. Mm. And I think at that point in his heart, he wanted to change the world. The yeah, the seed was he planted. Had, the seed was planted. Mm. And I kind of explained it this way. Part of the reason that uh, I think he fought so, so uh, hard for um, integration is because and, and, and the, the beloved community really is because he lost a dear friend and he was trying to find a way to reconcile with that friend because of the conditions that separated him. So I think it defined the rest of his life. You know, when I hear your story, it's hard to not believe that it is true that God ordained this before history began, that, that you would carry the torch, that your dad would do his part, that your grandpops, that everyone in your family would be um, God's messengers to really, just really advance the truth, which is that we're all made in his likeness and whatever the color of our skin is, matter not. Those children, when I hear the story, children don't see because they don't understand at that point anything other than the beauty in another human being. And they just wanna have fun and have friends, right? Too bad that that sometimes ends when we turn into uh, to young adults. I wanna ask you a question. Um, you know, I often talk about forgiveness because it's the thing that changed my life. When um, I was seven, we had lost a little, um, a little brother to a childhood illness, and my mom spun out of control. And my dad, who is now reverently known in our family as the source, the night my mom left the note and left us, my dad, the first thing he said to us at dinner that evening was, um, you need to forgive your mom. And he didn't just say the words. Um, he said the words in a way that I knew that he already had. And then he did everything the rest of his life and still does. And he's just an amazing human being. But um, I learned the greatest lesson in life that day was forgiveness. How did you, how do you um, go about forgiving the people that have hurt the King family? Well, there are two things that happen. One is just experiential and, and the other one is uh, you know, the influence of my mom, my grandfather. You know, we grew up in a family that really not only stressed the importance of unconditional love, even of your enemies, but they lived it, they embodied it. Mm. Uh, that's why I always encourage parents, you know, don't just teach your kids lessons, live those lessons mm. because they're gonna learn more and embrace it greater if they see you embody it. Uh, and so my mother, um, you know, my grandfather first, when we experienced uh, all these different um, tragic deaths, his children would gather the family together and he said, look, um, I'm not gonna stoop as low as to hate any person. Mm. And when he gathered us together, when my grandmother was shot, he said, um, I forgive the man who took my wife, because he was in a church and saw it and wanted to go for her, but they restrained him um, to save his life. And um, he uh, met with the gentleman and said, son, I'm gonna pray for you. And our family literally requested that they not uh, employed the death penalty because we don't believe in the death penalty. Um, and so having that example, and then my mother who used to always say to me and my siblings, you know, I don't hold grudges. Mm -hmm. And I knew of the experiences in her life where people heard her, betrayed her. Mm -hmm. And I watched how she still extended goodness and kindness to them in spite of that. So I had that ex powerful example. But I had to go on my own personal journey, sure. even though the, the example was there, of processing through my own um, interpretation of what happened to us sure. through all of these deaths, sure. um, because I, I really became very angry. And at one point, I hated, I hated white people. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I, 
nobody knew it I understand. because I, sure. the kind of house I it owned, would be natural to do that by right. the way yeah sure so internally I I that was welling up inside mm. of me and I had a strong stronger hate for white men and so it was a uh, an interview that I did and it, it wasn't when I was 20 you know I was carrying this well into my 30s uh, I did an interview in 2000, so I would have been, what, 36, 37 at that time, um, with James Robeson. Mm. And um, uh, he was talking to me about the loss of my uh, father and how it has impacted me. And in the middle of our interview, he just said, can I give you a hug? Now, this is being you know, pre-taped for television, and there was an audience there. Inside of me, I'm like, Heck no, <laughs> you know, but my mother taught me better. So I went sure. through the motions. It was one of the most genuine hugs that I had ever felt. Wow. It was like wow. God intercepted in that moment, intervened. And, and, and through him, I started feeling not only release, but relief. Um, and it, it, it wasn't something that immediately but sure. what it did is it started, started me on a new process. journey. Yeah. I found that the greatest way to affect the life of another is by giving them something they don't deserve. Right. Right. And if we can give someone else who's hurt us something they don't deserve, which is and what, that's what God Jesus planned, that's what he did for that's us, what he right? Did for and us. so when if we model Jesus. that, they know they don't deserve it. They know yeah. they don't deserve our love and forgiveness after they've hurt us. And my God, you all have been hurt. Yeah. We all have, but not like the King family. And I, I just um, thank God James hugged you um, because when, when he did, he started the process. He and did. It's a great reminder to all of us. And it may us. sound trite to people. No, I think, it, I think it's powerful the, stuff. You know, because, you know, people hug you from time to time, but God meets us. That's why we have to always have our vessels available. Well, I think you never audience, know when God's going to meet you. That's right. I, think I mean, come be, use you to meet somebody in the middle of their pain or their journey into something greater. We live in the uh, world, we're getting out of COVID or, or getting in the final chapter, it feels like anyway, hopefully. Um, and our audience would know that we talked a little bit about how we would greet on stage and we talked about like a fake fist bump or a fist bump and his hug then had Dr. King say, why don't we just hug? So, yeah, um, and I true. felt your hug. Yeah, um, that's true. And it meant a lot to me. You know, uh, when Jesus was asked, uh, you know, teacher, what's the greatest commandment, right? He said, mm -hmm. well, first we have to love God, have a governor. Somebody mm -hmm. calls us to our best, mm -hmm. right? With all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. And then the second is like it, he said, love your neighbor. And for all of us in the audience, there weren't any caveats, like love your neighbor if they're lovable, love their neighbor, your neighbor if they vote the way you do, or if they are the same color of skin. He just basically said that we need to love our neighbors. Is love a choice? Well, before I say whether it's a choice or not, I wanna take it one step further because Christ went on to say, I give you a new commandment, mm -hmm. which to me overrides that old one, not overrides it, but it transcends it because we had no example. It's one thing for somebody to say, that's why I was telling you earlier, the example of my mother sure. was yep. more powerful. Yep. When the Old Testament had those same commandments, there was no example. Jesus became the example. The example. So he's saying, do it like I did it. Mm. I showed you what love, unconditional agape love is. Um, and so to me, it's a commandment for those of us that are in Christ. Um, yeah, we can reject those commandments. Um, so to a certain extent, it's a choice to accept Jesus fully into your heart and to govern your life. And that's where the love comes from for yeah. me. So the choice is not the, the love. The choice, the choice is about first Jesus and letting the governor then, because then he un unleashes the he love. He unleashes, because the way that my father used to teach it when he talked about agape love, which, which is the foundation of his nonviolent um, philosophy and methodology, is that agape love is God's love flowing in and through the human heart. 
So let's move to, uh, to what's up today, right? Um, the scripture tells us that a nation divided against itself, uh, it's brought the desolation that every um, a, a house that's divided against itself cannot stand. Um, so it feels like at this point there's division, not that it's new, but that there's division in our nation. Um, and we created a creed last year at our organization. Let me try it out with you. Because when I was hearing the division in our program, we started saying to everyone, I am for everyone. I'm not for everything, but I'm still for everyone because in my relationship with God, I know that he's for me. He's not for everything I've ever done or thought or said, or, but he's always for me. He's always for us. So I just thought, well, we should be for each other. And the world has now turned into, well, if you're not in agreement with me on everything, mm -hmm. then I still can't be for you. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? You know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a true statement. Um, as long as people know that when people have conditions that they are dealing with, um, we have to find a way in spite of our perspective on those conditions to try to understand. Mm. I think oftentimes we don't take the time in being for people um, to understand their journey, the struggle, the things. Their story. Their, their story, yeah. Their story. Um, and I think part of the division in today's society is because there has been a lot of oppression. There's been a lot of discrimination. I'll tell you, Dr. King, in the last two weeks, I did um, something that I've never done. Um, I didn't ever felt feel like I needed to do it, but it was um, amazing. A childhood friend, Wyman Henderson, um, who I played ball with as, as a little boy, actually was the only white ball player on an all-black basketball team in oh, Miami, wow. Florida. Yeah, and, and Wyman and I were great friends. We broke bread at our house, um, and I broke bread at his house, and we were 11, 12, 13, and just like the, the description you had earlier about kids playing, it was, we're just, well, he lives in Atlanta now, and he's a great Christian man, and we talk all the time and love on each other all the time as Christian brothers. Um, two weeks ago, for the first time, I asked him some of those questions. Help me understand what it's like to be a black man, Wyman. Um, because I want to understand, because, you know, I do a lot of things generously in the lives of everyone I come across because of who governs me. Mm -hmm. But his answer really was so helpful. Mm -hmm. And then yesterday, as it turns out, Randy Curran, who played for the University of Georgia, who's an amazing Christian guy, uh, Ty Anderson and I um, had lunch with Rennie, and I asked him the question. Um, and it's not one of those things you normally are accustomed to asking, like, how does it feel to be a black woman, right? Or what it's like to be. But I asked Rennie, and I'll tell you, I left those two conversations changed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like I've done anything wrong. I think a lot of times people just feel like, I haven't done anything wrong. But that's different than what else are you doing intentionally to do something right, um, to do something better, to help this nation get less divided. And I know for me, those two exchanges were so enlightening. And I, it was cool because it was safe. These are two men who love me and I love them. We're Christian brothers and we can just talk. And it was just beautiful. And I told Rennie, I said, you know, when, uh, a couple weeks from now, I'm gonna have a big dinner with, um, with 25 of my, of my white guy friends and we're gonna have the same conversation with all 25 of them because I want you to be able to help us understand and to see through your eyes and your experiences and there ain't no anger or bitterness in either Wyman or Rennie, just beautiful men who could then help me understand. And it changed the way I think mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a very positive way and uh, sign me up. So it's like the, the Good Samaritan. Um, you know, I, I tell the story from this angle that, you know, the priest and the Levite were so consumed with their own world and they, they saw off the peripheral, this the person on the side, but you know, they were in their world, their yeah. silo and kept moving. Yep. The Samaritan, and I use this, this notion, the Samaritan got up close and personal. Mm. And, and, I, and I talk about me being nearsighted. I have on contacts. 
If I take them off, literally, people that I know can walk in the door and know. they have to come very close for me to make out who it is. I see, you know, images, unless I know somebody's walk and all that kind of stuff. I said, but when I put those glasses on, they pull it close to me and things become clear. Clar clarity happens and I can see it for what it is. And that's what you're doing. You're getting up close and personal to get the clarity. Because I think the distance, my father said, men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. Mm. They don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. Mm. And they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. And that's why removing those barriers that existed in the South, those signs, black here, white here, keeping people separated oh, and divided mm. um, is, is why he had to work in that area to get those physical signs out of the way. Now we got to get the signs in our heart because I say the signs have been removed but now they're etched in our heart. So now we got to get those out of the way and get close and get personal and have these, you know, points of connection to gain greater insight so that being for me now translates into the compassionate action to ensure that the things in our society that continue to bring harm and hurt to me and the people that look like me are changed and transformed. Um, so we, there's a lot of white, black, brown people that I know that love. Mm. We just need to do a better job in listening to each other and talking to each other and asking each other. And then we need to do the things every single day, set the example like we talked about earlier, right? Be the reflection of the example so that others can can get involved with the movement of making America less divided and more united, which is what we're all about. If your pops was, I know he's here with us right now. Um, it's uh, amazing and awesome to feel it. But um, if he was talking to us right now, would, would he suggest that since I have a dream speech that there's been progress? I mean, nobody can doubt, and certainly he wouldn't, that we've made substantial progress, um, but we still have substantial ways to go. Um, you know, there are things in our society today that are different from when even he was assassinated. Um, there is, uh, you know, he got a chance to see, you know, blacks and whites come together in integrated audiences. Yep. Uh, for instance, here in Atlanta in 1965 in January, the city finally decided to honor him after winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was the first integrated dinner at the downtown hotel. Wow. And it was because of the leadership of, um, um, I always forget Woodrow's first name, um, the, who was a part of the Coca-Cola company and, and really going behind the scenes with the, the corporate leaders say, you know, this is the right thing to do, you know? Mm. And if we don't, it's gonna impact you know, who takes we are courage, as a city. Takes courage right. to, to do that. And man. it's the reason why Birmingham didn't become the, the, the economic engine of the South because Atlanta, that's where they get this whole notion of the city's too busy to hate. Atlanta transcended that and said, no, we're gonna put that aside. Um, and, and so certainly, you know, that kind of coming together, he, he, he got the witness. Um, but I think, and, and the, to a tremendous amount of political progress he did not get to see. Mm. You know, the difference between now and back then, we weren't in the room. We weren't in the state houses. Right. We weren't sitting on- We um, weren't the president of the United States. Judges' benches. Yeah. We weren't president of the United States. We weren't on Capitol Hill. We weren't in the state capitals. Now there's a presence of, of African-Americans there. So he would certainly applaud um, the political pro pro progress in that regard in terms of the, um, the ability to, to, to elect people into office. But he was working <clears throat> very diligently on the area of economic injustice um, mm -hmm. at the time of his assassination when he called on the Poor People's Campaign. And um, I think he would still be troubled that the things he wrote to us in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos of Community, in that last chapter, The World House, where he talked about this being an interrelated uh, world, that we literally live in this world house and these are our brothers and sisters all over the world. Right. And he said, we must learn how to live together as brothers. And I had sisters, and he was 
brothers for us back then meant everybody. Right. Um, or we will be forced, uh, to, or together we will be forced to perish as fools. And then he went on to talk about how we've made so much progress scientifically and technologically, you know, how fast we can get to places, sure. you know, um, that we couldn't sure. in the days of yeah. the horse and buggy and all of that. Um, but now the airplanes can get us to another country this quick. Um, you know, the growth in technology. Um, but he said, our moral part, our moral self lags. And so we've got to overcome that lag so that as we advance technologically and scientifically, we don't destroy ourselves wow. in the misuse of our own instruments. Mm. And he said, so it's going to require a revolution of values. Yeah. And he said, well, you put people at the center. So he said, we must rapidly become a people-centered society rather than a thing-centered society. Mm. And we must find a way to elevate our loyalties beyond our tribe, our race, and even our nation to have an overriding loyalty all, to all of humanity. And so he was pushing us and, and saying, we've had to do that and we've got to look at, at that time. And I know this is a difficult conversation for people, but he said, we've got to find a way to re redistribute wealth, a radical redistribution of wealth in the country. Because if there's not a balance, eventually, if it's too head top heavy, <laughs> I mean, we're seeing, I think the pandemic tried to reveal some things to us. I'm not mm. sure we've grasped it yet. Um, but we've got to find a way to make sure that there's full employment in this, in this country um, so that people can live up to their best. And that means we got to provide and make sure there are provisions made for people educationally, housing, all that kind of stuff. So he would still be challenges to us on the economic front, that we've got to find a way to make sure that we are not so well off here in the United States of America, and yet over in this country, there's still people not only do they not have clean, clean drinking water, but they, they're not even empowered to ensure that they can sustain it. Yeah. So we got to move beyond just the mission of providing the water, but we got to teach people, you know, how to fish, so to speak. You know, our program um, is all is personal, professional best. It's all about, um, you know, there's where we are and there's a better place where we exactly. can be in every part of our life. And that's exactly. what I just heard you say. We've made progress, but not fast enough and not enough. And, um, and so let's close with this. Give us one thing that all of us can do, just one thing that everyone that's watching today can do um, that can help make um, the cause and us get better. What is it we can do? Well, I'm going to say it two separate ways. The first thing is we can do what Jesus said, be born again. Um, we've got to change our, our mindsets um, because there's some things, unfortunately, as much as I love America, there's some things that have been faulty in the, in the development of our country that we have to correct. Um, we have a campaign now at the King Center called Be Love. And my father said, Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is love correcting everything mm. that stands against love. So there's some things that we have to correct in our country, and we have to do it in the spirit and in the heart of love. And in order to do that, the born againness, we got to kind of purge some of the ways in which we have been um, taught and developed. I hate to say that. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, for instance, I always tell people the best place to start the journey to kind of helping America correct course on some things, if you can't physically go, I don't know if there's something online, but there's a place in Montgomery, Alabama, where the movement started. Um, and it's called the uh, Peace and Justice, um, Peace and Justice uh, um, Museum from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration. And it was founded by Brian Stevenson, uh, the movie Just Mercy, many people may know about. Um, and, and it really documents how 
this country was developed through, the white, through white supremacy in our systems and how slavery started and how that has been perpetuated. I don't think we're gonna get better until we deal with the root of, of, of institutionalized racism in this country. We're always gonna have people who hate people. We're always gonna have people who discriminate against people. But we gotta make sure that the structures and systems that we continue to create and that we continue to operate through don't have policies and practices that create in, unju injustice and inequity. And so it's gonna take a lot of work to transform those. But in order to do it, we gotta learn how we even got here. We gotta in stop. order to know where you're going, you gotta, you gotta know how you, gotta, you got to that place <laughs> you, where um, you are now. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's gonna start and finish with love because love will- love, That's will, what I said, love correcting love everything. Will, yeah, love. love will create the love roadmap. Love is the energy, is the fuel, is the it's, force. It's all of it because it will, inf it will hold us accountable to the standard that we need to be. It, and as we work through some troubling spaces, I mean, my father challenged systems but he loved the people as he I challenged. Love it. I That's love why, it. and we teach in the philosophy of nonviolence, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Hmm. So that's why certain things, when you see him, he is not trying to demoralize people, diminish people. He's not trying to win over them. He's right. trying to win them over. The, the argument on social media, right? Um, he, he did much better than that, much better oh, than yeah, that, no, much more powerful. Oh yeah, he batter back and forth. I, like I'll that. leave you with this. We have. Um, in our office in Alpharetta, on our wall, it's been on there for, um, well, since we moved into the building. Um, everyone can be great because everyone can serve, right? And I think if we all replace the word serve, it's love because service um, that's done well is really love. love. Um, so, love. hey, thank you so much for being a part of Personal and Professional Best today. And God bless you. And I wanna give you a big hug. <laughs>
that Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream comes true for all of our neighbors, as all of our neighbors were made in the image of God. In doing our part, we'll all be called to forgive others, yes. Doing our part will call all of us to forgive others and to accept and love others, even if they've hurt us, and even if we don't agree with them. And finally, doing our part will call us to serve others, the greatest calling in history, a calling that all of us can answer. If we do, we'll help unlock our personal and professional best, and we'll help our nation to become its best. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.